All right, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to session four, which is on nanotechnology and human performance. Um, my name is Julius Lux. I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering and a proud member of the IIN. Uh, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce our, our speakers for this session, Professor John Rogers and Steve Zhu. John Rogers is the Lewis Simpson and Kimberly Query Professor of Material Science and Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, Mechanical Engineering, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Chemistry, Neurological Surgery, and Dermatology. Uh, John's research includes fundamental and applied aspects of nano and molecular scale fabrication, as well as materials and patterning techniques for unusual electronic and photonic devices with an emphasis on bio-integrated and bio-inspired systems. He's published more than 800 papers, is an inventor on over 100 patents and patent applications, 70 of which, which are licensed uh, or in active use by large companies or startups he has co-founded. Um, John received a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry and a Bachelor of Science in Physics from UT Austin, a Master's in Physics and Chemistry and a PhD in Physical Chemistry from M MIT. Uh, he was a prestigious junior fellow in the Harvard University Society of Fellows before joining Bell Labs as a member of the technical staff and then serving as director of the Condensed Matter Physics Research Department. In 2003, he joined the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where he held a Swanland Chair, which is the highest chaired position in the university. Uh, and in 2016, we were fortunate enough to recruit him here to Northwestern, where he's become the founding director of the Center on Bio-Integrated Electronics, which was endowed as a Query Simpson Institute of Bioelectronics in 2019. Steve Zhu is the Ruth K. Frankel, MD, Assistant Professor of Dermatology and the Director of Medical Research at the Query Institute for Bioelectronics. He obtained his undergraduate degree in engineering from Rice University, Master of Science in Health Policy and Finance from the London School of Economics, and his MD from Harvard Med School. Uh, his residency was at the McGall Medical Center at Northwestern, where he also completed a postdoc fellowship in material science and engineering with John. Um, Steve has developed medical device technologies across multiple medical fields, including dermatology, orthopedics, cardiology, and patients' non-adherence. He now leads a spin-out, spin Cybel Health, launching advanced ICU-grade wearable sensors in neonatal and maternal monitoring, which to date has monitored more than 13,000 patients in 20 countries. Please welcome John and Steve. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Julius. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, quite frankly. I want to start by congratulating Chad and the broader you know, faculty team that's been associated with the IIN you know, over these you know, 20 years. It's really you know, prescient to get in early uh, into nanotechnology and to really establish a tremendous legacy where I think the uh, Institute has served as a really powerful vehicle for driving collaborations here at Northwestern, bringing in large center level uh, grants, establishing networks, education and outreach, and, and that's been really impressive to see that fold out you know, uh, over, over the years, kind of, kind of roll out in that way. Um, this is my third time to participate in this uh, symposium. Uh, it's a really famous kind of annual uh, event. Um, I was invited by Chad to uh, give a talk in 2012 when I was still at University of Illinois at a relatively kind of early career stage. I got the email from Chad. It's like, oh, this is so great, you know, <laughs> come, come up to Chicago and get, give a talk and interact with a lot of, a lot of famous people. And that, that was fantastic. And then I guess that went pretty well because I got another invite, you know, 2017 after I'd moved here to Northwestern. And so that was another fantastic uh, experience. And so here I am again, 2022. And so I'm thinking there's kind of a pattern here. It's 2012, 2017, 22. I'm like on a five-year cycle or something like that. <laughs> and so I'm going to pencil in 2027, if that's okay with you, Chad, TBD, but I'll keep that you know, uh, slot available in my, in my calendar. But, but it's been really fantastic. So the last two times I've, I've given uh, talks at this uh, event is really based, based on science and kind of you know, find foundational kind of fundamental uh, work. This talk will be much different. Uh, and so I'll just breeze through kind of the, the foundations in nanotechnology that establishes uh, kind of the engineering capabilities for classes of electronics that we refer, refer to as bioelectronics. And that's kind of my role in this broader presentation. 
And then I'm going to hand it off to uh, my partner in crime here, Steve Zhu, who's really taking those ideas and uh, translating them uh, in, into the real world, really, really at a global scale. And, and we're very excited about that. And so that's really kind of the meat of this presentation. And I'm just providing a little bit of the appetizer, and then you get the main course from, uh, from Steve. So, so that's uh, by way of uh, background. So, so the title here is you know, Nanotechnology for Bioelectronics. It really is a, an important nanotech uh, component here, but, but in the service of thinking about uh, a future for how we do healthcare. And it's a lot more built around engineering than, than uh, molecular scale therapeutics that you've heard about in some of the other talks. So hopefully it's a good change of pace to give you a sense of the breadth of impact that you can think about with, with nanotechnology. So I'll start with a little bit of motivation, give you a description of kind of the materials and the engineering approaches that have worked pretty well for us, give you a sense of what the resulting you know, technologies look like, uh, focus on skin interfaced systems with applications in ICU grade continuous monitoring of physiological health parameters associated with vulnerable populations at the beginning of life, in particular maternal, fetal, neonatal health. And, uh, and again, I'll hand it off to, to Steve to, to get into the details of what that's all about. So let me start by uh, you know, providing the vision. And, and, and the idea is to develop you know, electronic engineered systems that you know, offer the sophistication and functionality that you would see in a piece of consumer electronics gadgetry, but really designed to be biocompatible in a very fundamental way. So you can think about an electronic interface to the brain maybe as a starting point for conceptualizing what might be possible. So think about electronics that either rest on the surface of the brain or distribute through the three-dimensional neural networks that make up the brain. And that electronics could sort of live in a symbiotic way with, with living tissue to provide so sort of digital capabilities and mapping out neural uh, activity and, and modulating that activity. So really detecting the disorders of the brain as they developed and then delivering electrical stimulation as, as a form of therapy uh, that could complement that associated with uh, more traditional biochemical pharmaceutical approaches. And so that, that's you know, kind of what you, what you can think about in the context of an interface to the brain. But, but if you could develop that kind of technology, you wouldn't stop with the brain. You'd think about all kinds of other vital organs as interface points. Uh, for, for leveraging that kind of technology in a broader sense. You can imagine very thin membranes, almost like instrumented pericardium that would go around the outside surface of the heart to provide you know, sophisticated capabilities and spatiotemporal mapping of electrophysiological behaviors and pacing the heart in a very sophisticated way. Maybe you could pick up arrhythmias and then eliminate them as, as they uh, emerge. So like electronically augmented you know, organs would be kind of the 10 to 20 year vision. Or you, know, you think about an interface to the skin, which is by, uh, the body's largest uh, organ system where you could develop skin-like or epidermal-like electronics that could sort of in an imperceptible way interface to the surface of the skin where that, that interface could establish uh, the basis for measuring all kinds of fundamental uh, you know, physiological processes that provide indications around health status. And so that's what I'll focus on uh, today is that skin interface. And so if you're going to develop a skin-like technology to interface with the skin, uh, it's useful to kind of take a step back and ask what are the fundamental design principles you know, in biology around around the skin and it's a spectacularly you know sophisticated piece of engineering in, in a sense with length scales that span all the way from sort of nanometer dimensions to macro scale dimensions it's a multi-layered architecture with three-dimensional you know uh, functionality and electronics and microfluidics it's self-healing there's all, all kinds of things that are very powerful uh, with skin and, and so from an engineering standpoint you might say well what kind of basic features could I pull out from thinking about the biology and, and embed those in, in man-made systems to create electronics that would be you know, compatible with the skin, with physical properties matched to the skin is kind of the idea. And you could think about um, you know, this as a starting point. You know, the, the silicon integrated circuit is the foundation of essentially all commercialized forms of, of, of electronics. And, and ask the question, what would it take from a material science standpoint or a nanoengineering standpoint to reformulate that kind of technology to look like the skin? is kind of this, uh, the uh, problem statement. And um, you know, that, that is uh, you know, a topic of central interest to us at the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics. So there's a really powerful synergy between this institute and the IIN, because a lot of the nanotechnology work that's happening in the IIN serves as the foundations for you know, developing these kind of bioelectronic systems, which is the focus of this particular institute. So I just wanted to mention that. So I'm going to just very quickly step through a couple of the basic ideas in nanotechnology that allow us to begin to you know, move electronics into this biocompatible uh, type of format. And, and one is that, that we move away 
away from the use of a silicon wafer uh, as a functional substrate for electronics. Instead, think about silicon nanomembranes, so ultra-thin sheets of monocrystal and silicon, thick enough to support the kind of electronic functionality you ultimately like to achieve, but thin enough to be very bendable. So you think about bending mechanics, it's pretty simple. If you have a two by four piece of wood, it's not very bendable. A sheet of play, uh, paper is bendable just by consequence of the thin geometry. Same kind of mechanics apply to silicon. So you make these silicon nanomembranes. They're very flexible and floppy, many orders of magnitude more bendable than a silicon wafer. And bending is kind of an uh, intrinsic and uh, you know, attractive physical characteristic if you want to mount things on, on or in, in the human body because we're, you know, sort of a time dynamic system that involves a lot of bending deformations. But you can't just replace the wafer with a silicon nanomembrane because it doesn't, doesn't provide the kind of mechanical robustness that you would ultimately need for a practical system. You have to think about these nanomembranes as building blocks. You integrate them with some other kind of substrate material, maybe plastic or an elastomer or something like that. So now you're talking about extreme heterogeneous integration between, you know, a hard, thin material material like a silicon nanomembrane and maybe a sheet of plastic. And how do you do that? And how do you manage the interface adhesion? Turns out to be uh, easier and easier, actually, as you move into these nanoscale dimensions just associated with the uh, basic uh, you know, scaling of uh, fracture mechanics. And so I won't say much more about that. I don't want to take you through the equations or the graphs, but that, that's kind of the, the idea at, at a high level. So how do you create these membranes or these nanoscale ribbons? Well, we've developed various kinds of etching techniques, so chemical etching techniques allow us to shave these nanoscale uh, elements of material from the near surface of a silicon wafer. So silicon wafer, very well-developed piece of materials technology available at commodity cost. Now we just shave off the near surface thick enough to support the kind of electronic functionality we want, but with this extreme bendability. So very powerful first step toward biocompatible electronics. But if you think about the skin, it's not only bending, it also stretches. It has a certain level of elasticity. And making silicon very thin makes it bendable, but not stretchable. So it requires a secondary idea to add on top of that first one, whereby we take these silicon ribbons and we bond them to a soft rubber substrate that gives us the kind of stretchy mechanics that we ultimately need, but not in a flat geometry. We bond them in this kind of wavy configuration. So now we have a hard, soft composite structure that acts like an accordion bellows, essentially, from, from a mechanical standpoint. So we get an end-to-end -end stretchability uh, without fracturing the, the brittle silicon material. So that's basically it. You add a lot of engineering elaborations on top of those basic ideas, and now you can begin to build systems that uh, you know, have elasticity and elastic modulus matched to, the, uh, matched to the skin. So this is supposed to be a movie that's not working. But, but anyway, we can design these things from a uh, finite element modeling standpoint to um, you know, engineer the geometries, not only with this out-of-plane kind of rippled configuration, but also in plane as well, these springy type of interconnects, and you put together all the metals and the semiconductors, the dielectrics you need, you embed it into a thin, a thin elastomer, and you can create a system that has uh, physical properties precisely matched to those of the skin. Oh, there we go. So this is done in collaboration with a, a computational mechanician, Yang Gong Huang, here in mechanical engineering. So this kind of mechanism provides a, a design guide for how do you lay out these hard materials in this soft matrix to give you the kind of effective material properties you need to match a, a tissue interface of interest. So you can do all of that. I think I talked in depth about all the details of how that works uh, in, in my presentation in 2012, and so I'm not going to rehash that. But you can make all that work, so now you can build systems that have physical properties precisely matched to the epidermis. The consequence of that is you put these on the skin, they're physically imperceptible, because it's essentially like a second layer of skin on top of the natural skin. And it establish that, establishes that persistent physical interface uh, that you can exploit for doing kind of ICU-grade measurements of physiological health parameters, but now outside of the ICU into the home in a continuous wireless fashion. I'll get, to, get back to that in a second. So that was 2011. We got a little bit better in 2014. And one of the main motivating factors in moving to Northwestern was to try to figure out how to take this technology and render it in forms that could address real unmet clinical needs. And that's really been our focus ever since 2015, 2016 or so. And during that time period, we've been able to develop a wide portfolio of devices. You mount them anywhere on a relevant part of the anatomy. They can operate in a wireless fashion to capture uh, you know, 
signs of uh, you know, health that, that physicians and nurses are familiar with, but also uh, unconventional vital signs as well. So expanding the breadth and the depth of data around uh, making that critical health uh, assignment. And this was a cover feature article in uh, National Geographic talked about that broader portfolio. So again, I won't go through all the details, but each one of those devices can embed many different types of sensors that operate based on thermal physics or electrical fluidic. You can put tiny channels in these systems. You can capture tiny volumes of sweat. You can do biomarker analysis in sweat. You can measure the mechanical properties of the skin. You can measure body sounds as well, all kinds of optical interfaces as well. So you put it all together, yet each device is multimodal in terms of its functionality, and you can mount multiple devices at different locations of the body in a time-synchronized way, so it becomes multinodal as well. So full body assessments of uh, your health status are possible with an emphasis on clinical quality, continuous monitoring at cost points that allow us to depl uh, deploy at a global scale, as uh, Steve will talk about in a little bit, so it can be available to everyone, not just those who have access to very high-end uh, hospital uh, facilities. And so when we started this, actually collaborating with Amy, Amy Poller and Aaron Hombas, uh, associated with Lurie Children's Hospital and, uh, and our medical school here, uh, to really focus on a class of patient that we felt could benefit most strongly from this kind of technology, sort of a compelling unmet clinical need, and that is in vital signs monitoring in the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, which is currently done with uh, you know, really lousy engineering approaches, such as those illustrated on the left of this, uh, of this slide. It's you know, adhesive tapes that can sometimes tear the skin when they need to be peeled off to clean the baby, for example, hardwired connections to expensive external boxes of data acquisition electronics, sort of you know, uh, frustrating the natural motions of the baby, preventing you know, many um, you know, uh, interactions between parents and, and child, uh, you know, the, the wires get in the way of that. And they also complicate even the most simple and basic aspects of uh, routine clinical care. So in 2015, 2016, we decided we would try to build our wireless uh, skin-like electronics to reproduce that kind of function but without the wires, without the invasive adhesive tapes, uh, but without any sacrifice in uh, data quality. And so just fast forward, you can do all of that. We published that in, uh, in spring of uh, 2019. Uh, we got a IRB approval for use of those devices in an operating NICU at Lurie Children's uh, Princess Women's Hospital as well. We've done about 200 premature babies coming through the NICU, comparing the data streams coming out of our device quantitatively to those that are used clinical standard. This is an example of a 26-week gestational age premature baby at Lurie's. The hand on the right side of that image is that of Aaron Hanvas, who's head of neonatology uh, at Lurie. So all of that works. It's great. We actually expanded beyond the NICU to the PICU. So these are older babies, a pediatric intensive care unit, but many of whom require 24-7 monitoring of vital signs due to uh, their critically ill nature. And this is an example of one of those babies. You see the device on the chest, the one on the foot. These are time synchronized. So the one on the chest is capturing continuous electrocardiograms from which you can determine heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate. There's also a digital temperature sensor in the chest unit, so we get a pretty good approximation to core body temperature. The device on the uh, foot is providing uh, photoplethysmography from which we can get blood oxygenation. And because those two devices are time synchronized, we also get hemodynamic information as well. And so it's all quantitative, uh, massive amounts of data, typically distilled down into just heart rate, SpO2, respiration rate, and temperature, but tremendous additional information uh, available in that data, and that's something we're looking at uh, using advanced machine learning uh, techniques. And so this kind of work really demands an intimate interface between sort of engineering science and medical science, and uh, we are fortunate to have great collaborators across the uh, medical campus uh, downtown, not just our medical school, but uh, Prentice and Lurie's as well. And this is a, a front, front page uh, cop copy of that uh, sort of seminal paper that we published in spring of uh, tw 2019. Uh, nurses involved as well as co-authors. So you can think about that as uh, you know, kind of reproducing what's done today, but it's also a platform for going beyond. So you can think about novel metrics of health status. So you have a high bandwidth accelerometer in the uh, chest unit, you can determine vocal biomarkers, for example, of health status. You can determine uh, physical activity, uh, motion, that, that kind of thing as well. So we published that in spring 2019. Shortly thereafter, we were contacted by uh, program managers at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Save the Children organization, asking whether we could take that technology, render it in a form that will allow cost-effective sort of economic viability for use in lower and middle-income countries. And that turned out to be a very exciting engineering challenge. We took that on, published the results one year later, uh, and deployed into Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, India, Pakistan, uh, and Mexico. And so it's very exciting. I'm actually wearing one of the devices right now. And so it's streaming data to my smartphone if you want to check this out after the, the talk. So we have full ECG and uh, you know, full complement of ICU grade 
uh, measurements, uh, and everything looks good so far, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> My resting heart rate is about 55, 60, it's about 80 right now, so that's maybe not too surprising, I'm a little stressed up here. But um, anyway, this is an example of my, my students, uh, you know, in Zambia, uh, training healthcare workers on the use of these technologies, it's been very exciting. And so uh, at this point, we kind of decided we can't continue to do this work at this level with grad students and postdocs. And so it really compelled us to put in place a startup company, sort of a bootstrap lean startup company that could take the ball forward. Uh, and that's uh, a good, good transition point. And I'll hand things off to Steve, and he'll talk about uh, what he's been able to do with, with his translational engineering. Thank you, John, very much for that great uh, setup. And uh, you know, as a physician engineer myself, I think the greatest honor and joy you can have is taking some of these amazing engineering advances in nano, uh, in, in, in engineering, and translating them into clinical products that make a difference every single day. And I think one of the things that we have done is, is taken that foundational work that John has talked about and turn it into medical devices. And um, I thought the previous talk was really powerful because there was a, a clear frustration, right? When you have advanced technology, a major unmet clinical need, why does it take so long, right? And I think that is something that, that faces us as well. Um, on at least the uh, medical device side of it, we can go a little bit faster, right? So we, we actually got FDA clearance. Um, uh, we actually have two, we have one pending actually by the end of the year, where every single parameter that you see on that slide is now FDA cleared. Um, and when you start with the NICU, you can't replace just one wire. You gotta replace all of them, right? Because you're still tethered. And I think that's what is exciting about the Annie One system. And probably my major, most significant professional accomplishment was to name the sensor. You know, we had a lot of amazing devices in, in John's labs and we were very creative. We would call them sensors, right? And so it got confusing in lab meetings and things. So Annie stands for Advanced Neonatal Epidermal Sensor as sort of an homage to, to where it started, but has stuck for obviously our work in adult monitoring and beyond. So I think that one thing that, that is sort of missing is that you, you, you develop this advanced technology, you convert it into a form factor that you can scale and grow, you can get it through the FDA, but it's still not enough, right? As a clinician, as someone who's working at the front lines, you need that data to be in a place where you can interpret it, you can make actions, and ultimately that means electronic health record. And so behind the sensor is a whole bed of software from mobile applications all the way up to the cloud, to clinical alerts, and embedded AI machine learning so that healthcare decisions can be made better, enabled by the technology that underlies it. And so I think one of the things I think is really important is within medical science, when new things come up, almost invariably, it's expensive. And, and, and so for us, when we had our first investment from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, part of our DNA is to think about how do we take advanced technology, how do we make ICU-grade monitoring available everywhere, but how do we make it cheaper from the very start? Not wait five years, not wait 10 years, but do it now, today. Um, as a doctor practicing, you don't even think twice when you open up a cabinet, rip open a package, and stick it on a patient to monitor. That's $10, that's $15. In some places around the world, that's a month's wage. We spend $30 every day on these disposable systems with $10,000 box units, and we don't think about it. In Africa, in low and middle income countries, it's simply impossible, unobtainable. So that's why we worked on our technology to enable it to work with low cost Android devices that are already widely available even in some of the poorest places in the world. We made our sensors rechargeable, reusable, using ultra low cost adhesives and consumables to enable costs that are 10 to 30 times less expensive per patient per day so everyone can have access to it. So I think overall we're excited about the scale. So we, within that sort of early foundational work in science, uh, have launched more than 4,000 sensors, have monitored more than 13,000 individuals in 20 countries, um, but we expect that number to grow exponentially to 1,000 patients a week next year, to 10,000 patients per week the year after, and hopefully millions by the time we're done. But I think when you develop a platform technology, uh, focus is really important, right? You can't do everything. And the areas that we are really drawn towards are areas of unmet clinical need. Uh, unfortunately, premature babies and uh, poor pregnant persons in low and middle income countries, they don't have the funding for lobbying groups in, in Washington. So we wanted to focus on those areas where we believe the technology had the greatest impact for good, not necessarily the biggest market size. 
So I think there's two numbers that are very powerful. More than 800 pregnant persons die every single day giving birth. 97% of the morbidity and mortality come from low and middle income countries. More than 7,000 babies die every single year with, again, the vast majority being in low and middle income countries. So the problem with this is that when you look at what's happening today, not at Prentice, but in Zambia, but in Ghana, places that John and I have both been to, the most advanced technology to monitor pregnant women and fetuses is the Pernod's horn. It's basically a cylinder of metal or wood. It hasn't changed in 150 years. And then when you add that single midwife to 50 women or 100, it's virtually impossible to catch the signs and signals of deterioration that can be life-ending for these women. And so what we're trying to do is enable low- and middle-income countries to skip what we have today, the expensive, the bulky, the uncomfortable, the skin-damaging systems, and transition them directly into wireless, wearable devices that are low-cost, mobile-enabled, cloud-enabled, with embedded machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think that it's not just a problem of low- and middle-income countries. While we have done better as a world in reducing maternal mortality, there's actually been only two countries worldwide that actually has not seen a decrease in maternal mortality, the United States and the Dominican Republic. So we're not in good company, right? Everywhere else has gotten better, even though it remains a major problem. But the other side of it is these deaths are preventable. Two-thirds of those deaths happen with medical conditions that can be detected by the very same sensors that we're making with life-saving interventions so long as they're detected and intervention can be delivered. So I think there's a real opportunity for these de devices and technologies to make a difference. So we have done now more than 13,000 pregnant women worldwide, taking what we're doing today uh, into something that's in the future. And notice when a gravid women, uh, you have a very curvilinear sort of surface, and therefore soft, flexible electronics not only enable more comfort, but better signal fidelity. And we have recently completed, just a month ago, with the University of North Carolina and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this study in five different countries worldwide, four in low, low and middle income set settings, where through these 13,000 women, we tracked everything that happened to them. What drug they got, what their medical history was, what ultrasound data they had, and most importantly, what sensor data came out from our device and technology. So this is an example of a woman, gravid, wearing our system, collecting all this ICU-grade data as part of this clinical trial. And what we took from there is not only the ability to deliver point-of-care data that you can use for clinical decision-making, but a future where I'm really excited, where that data can support clinical intelligence. So yes, we could monitor every important thing that you would want to know as an obstetrician or gynecologist or midwife, but more importantly, we know what happens to you in this cohort. And why is that important? Well, at the end of the day, for machine learning to make a huge difference in clinical medicine, the limiting reagent is well-labeled data biobanks. And in this setting, with 13,000 pregnant women, we had hundreds of cases of stillbirth, maternal death, sepsis, C-section. All those endpoints are tracked and monitored, and we are able to recreate those with vital signs that we are collecting with our system. And so the future of that right now, that is ongoing work for our team, is taking the data from ultrasounds, labs, sensors collected by our ANI system, and using the most advanced AI machine learning algorithms to predict for the bad things that happened in pregnancy, enabled by a study of this size. And I believe to date it would represent one of the largest obstetrical clinical trials ever conducted, uh, leveraging technology that's come out of Northwestern uh, to enable better clinical intelligence and decision making. So we're very excited about the scale that we've achieved. Um, it's, a, it's an effort and, and, and thing that took a, an entire team and, and continued to grow. Uh, we're in 20 countries worldwide, but, but hope to add more in the next coming uh, years. And uh, I'd like to just thank everyone here for your attention and the ability to, to, to give our uh, story and our talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John and Steve. We have time for just uh, one question. I'm going to ask it. Um, I'm going to go back to your, uh, well, first of all, I, I was blown away by the entire thing, so congratulations. That was amazing. Uh, on a technical question, I noticed there was a difference between some of the things that you were presenting, John, with the really thin membrane and then some of these devices. I, I wanted just to know why the different form factor and a specific question about powering 
the super thin devices? Yeah, yeah, great, great question, uh, Julia. So, so when you start on this program, it's sort of, um, you know, what, what is the ultimate in engineering that, that would allow us to get to the kind of this skin-like, you know, device uh, vi vision that we had? And so those systems uh, operate in a battery-free manner, so it's uh, magnetic inductive coupling that we use to wirelessly uh, transmit power to the device is the same link that we use to, you know, extract data back out. And so I think that's where the future will ultimately uh, take us. But when the Gates Foundation uh, contacted us, they, it, it became critical to hit the economic uh, requirements of a few cents per patient monitoring day to have a reusable platform. And those ultra-thin devices are great in sort of single use, which you know, satisfies the requirements at Lurie and Prentiss, does not satisfy the requirements in health clinics in Zambia, for example. So we had to move to a different engineering design that embeds batteries and wireless recharging capabilities directly into the device and uh, offer sort of a level of physical robustness that allows for hundreds of cycles of use so you can amortize the cost of the device out of the cost per patient monitoring day. And so that was a dri driving consideration to sort of meet the requirements in LMICs that required a, a shift in some, some of the engineering aspects. Yeah. Well, let's thank John and Steve one more time.